Hello and welcome to this video lecture that serves as an introduction to Human Resource Management or HRM or sometimes the field is just called HR. I am Dr. Miller and I'll be narrating the following video lecture. Let's get started. The business function of HRM has a reputation for being many things. Some are good and some are bad. What is HRM? Many researchers and firms view HR as talent management or as the management of human capital. Whatever the term and the view of HR is by professionals, HR usually serves dual purposes. Employees view HR as their sounding board or intermediary to management and they go to HR with their problems. Management views HR as their intermediary with employees on areas like compensation, performance management, etc. HR professionals thus often perform two roles. HR as a function serves in a staff or advisory function instead of in a production function. That is, firms do not usually produce people unless they are an employment agency. They provide products and services. The managers of products, services, divisions, geographic areas, etc. are called line managers. HR managers are staff managers. One of the most interesting things about being an HR professional is that it is an ever-changing field, particularly with regard to legal issues and technology. HR professionals must stay abreast of labor laws and court cases, both of which are ever-changing. With regard to technology, HR professionals must be familiar with database management, sometimes to the extent of even knowing some structured query language, or SQL. They must know internet backends and data analysis software. Gone are the days when HR was one blue-haired old lady down the hall who gave you your paycheck on a Friday afternoon. Modern businesses have highly interlocked HR functions, and HR is also interlocked with business functions, like operations and management. Let's move on. Let's talk about the interrelated functional areas of HRM. These areas are important because they are the ins and outs, the form and the function, etc., of human resource management. The first is HR planning and strategy. This function serves as the linking mechanism between corporate strategy and employee strategy. For example, if a firm wants to open a new factory, they will need employees to work there. HR sets up the strategy to find and select those employees based upon required skills and experiences, as well as the determination of the relevant labor market. Corporate expansion is not regularly engaged in on a by-the-seat-of-one's-pants manner. There is an operations strategy for the new factory. There is a marketing strategy for the facility's products, etc., etc., None of these things gets done without the efforts of people. HR finds and hires and appraises the performance of these people. A second function is recruitment and selection. If people are the most important asset of a company, as many firms like to say, then finding the right people is of utmost importance. The science of selection testing is complex and relies heavily on statistics and psychometric analysis. HR professionals with those skills are in high demand, so companies can avoid the high cost of employee turnover. A third function is training and development. Employees are often required to attend training sessions like orientation sessions, as well as ongoing competency training. If a company wants to effectively compete, it has to have the best trained employees. Most companies have ongoing training opportunities, which employees may be required to attend. If a training opportunity comes your way, take it, even if you have no interest in it now. A competitor might be looking for someone like you who has that necessary training. Compensation and benefits is the fourth function. Most people will not work for free. 
Providing competitive compensation and benefit packages can attract great applicants and can keep great employees. The job of compensation analyst is one of the best jobs in HR because it involves staying abreast of the latest trends in benefit plans and the competitive pay schedules of various industries. Health and safety is the fifth function. Some jobs are simply riskier than others. All jobs must be reasonably safe and the workplace should be relatively free from accidents. The Occupational Health and Safety Administration, also known as OSHA, is in charge of investigating workplace accidents, helping organizations stay safe and keep employees informed, as well as making sure that companies obey the laws. If a company has a horrendous record of workplace accidents, it might find it hard to recruit and select applicants or find it hard to give a proper compensation and benefit plan to attract them or be perennially understaffed because of these things. Employee and labor relations is the sixth function. In right-to-work states, employees cannot be forced to join a labor union, but in many states, they can. Companies in all states have to abide by various labor laws focused on disability rights, labor union rights, discipline rights, due process rights, etc. A company that runs afoul of labor laws can be fined exorbitantly, and that may make it hard for them to convince people to stay there or convince people to apply there. All of these functions are held together and underpinned by job analysis, which is the science of determining and documenting what people actually do in their jobs. Studying job analysis is horrifically boring, but the job of a job analyst is actually quite interesting. If firms do not know what it is that people do in their jobs, then they cannot determine appropriately where to recruit applicants, which selection tests to use, how much training a new employee may need to perform the job well, how much to pay people to do that job, they may not be able to determine the risk to employees' health and safety, and be aware of certain industry-specific laws. Job analysis is the very foundation of everything in HRM. Let's move on. Let's combine the function of HR planning with HR recruitment and selection on this slide. Planning involves the assessment of future needs for personnel. These needs can be mathematically ascertained with Markov analysis, which we will learn about and perform in a future video lecture. Planning also involves issues of external pay equity. The determination of how much to pay people is important to corporate budgets, and some budgets limit the number of employees that can be hired based upon prevailing wages. X dollars in a budget divided by Y annual salaries equals Z number of employees hired. Recruitment is all about attracting qualified people. Some firms use websites like Indeed.com and Glassdoor.com. Others rely quite heavily on in-house job postings that seek persons already working at a company who may be interested in other jobs at the company. Other employees, I'm sorry, other companies rely heavily on employee referrals. The pros of employee referrals. Start the slide over. Testing. One, two, three. Let's combine the functions of HR planning with HR recruitment and selection on this slide. Planning involves the assessment of future needs for personnel. These needs can be mathematically ascertained with Markov analysis, which we will learn about and perform in a future video lecture. Planning also involves issues of external pay equity. The determination of how much to pay people is important to corporate budgets and some budgets simply limit the number of employees that can be hired based upon prevailing wages. For example, X dollars in a budget divided by Y annual salaries 
equals Z number of employees hired. Recruitment is all about attracting qualified people. Some firms use websites like Indeed.com and Glassdoor.com. Others rely quite heavily on in-house job postings that seek persons already working at the company who may be interested in other jobs at the company. Other companies rely heavily on employee referrals. The pros of employee referrals are that companies tend to get top-notch referrals because the employee who is making the referral of their friend has their own name and reputation on the line. Cons of employee referrals include the possibility of discrimination issues, as most people who are referred by people are those who are demographically similar to those people. After all, most, but certainly not all, of our friends tend to be in the same racial or ethnic group as us. If a company is on the borderline of adverse impact, employee referrals can then put them over the tipping point. I'll discuss adverse impact in another lecture. Selection is the process of choosing whom to hire from applicants. This involves the development, administration, and scoring of all sorts of tests. All selection techniques are tests. A test is anything on which the full or partial determination of employability is based. For example, the submission of a resume is a test. Resumes are evaluated and likely placed into three stacks. Yes, maybe, and no. Interviews are tests, and they should be scientifically based and scored, etc., etc. It all starts with job analysis, though. Again, if we don't know what people do in their jobs, then we cannot plan future workforce needs, nor can we effectively recruit and select employees. Let's move on. Testing, one, two, three. When we think of training from the HR perspective, we usually are referring to lower level employees. These training events range from mandatory orientation sessions to equipment usage training to safety and hazard avoidance seminars to remedial courses in math and writing to advanced training like vestibule and simulated training for airline pilots. When we refer to development in the HR functional sense, we are usually referring to upper level employees like managers and executives. Some examples of this sort of training involve leadership development courses, executive education classes, and strategy creation and evaluation sessions. There are types of training and development that are relevant to both lower level employees and upper level managers and executives. Career planning is an example and involves an ongoing process of formal and informal mentoring as well as coaching sessions and resume development and even outplacement sessions in the event of a corporate downsizing. The key to all of this is the performance appraisal, which can highlight areas of necessary improvement. If you don't know how well an employee is doing on the job, you cannot determine if they need additional training to do the job. Once again, all of the HR functions are linked together. Let's move on. Regarding compensation and benefits, we need to separate the two. Compensation is reflected on one's paycheck. Compensation is money. It also comes in the form of retirement contributions, which is money too. HR professionals design compensation packages and systems to attract the most qualified applicants, to reward the most proficient employees, and to tie in with the overall strategy of the company. In a circular sort of way, HR needs a seat at the strategy table, and then they drill down and implement company strategy based upon company budgets for labor. Because most companies no longer provide pensions to employees, the competition for employees can sometimes hinge on the retirement contributions that the company makes. There are many components to such contributions, namely from the perspective of the employee, the concern is how much of an employee's contribution is matched by the company. 
These packages serve as an effective recruiting tool to help differentiate one employer from another. Another form of compensation is in the form of deferred compensation. As a strategy, companies want to tie executive performance to corporate performance, so they sometimes give stock options that executives can implement after some defined period of time. There are other forms of deferred compensation, and that will require a whole other lecture. Benefits are another tool in the HR professional's toolkit that helps them recruit applicants, Benefit plans are often tied to health and safety issues in the workplace as they come in the form of health insurance and disability insurance. In addition to the administration of rights under the Family and Medical Leave Act, or FMLA, employers of a certain size are required to give employees who meet certain requirements time off to care for their own health, the health of a family member, and other similar issues. HR professionals administer these forms of paid time off, or PTO, and unpaid time off, like usage of the FMLA. However, this is often complicated by company policies that require that an employee first use their vacation and sick days, which are paid, before they start the 12 weeks off of FMLA leave, which is unpaid. You can see how such things get complicated, and an HR professional with knowledge of benefit plans and the law comes in handy. But wait, there's more. There are certain non-financial rewards that employees seek and that HR professionals help implement with a keen eye on various aspects of the human experience at work. Some people take some jobs almost solely for personal fulfillment, or they seek an affiliation with others. Others take jobs that help with employee self-actualization and that provide a sense of accomplishment. Putting a price on those things is super hard to do, but they do comprise a certain form of compensation and a definite benefit to taking the job. Let's move on. Everyone wants a safe working environment, employees and employers alike. HR professionals are responsible for monitoring the workforce and workplace, staying abreast of workplace safety laws, complying with OSHA requirements, alerting management and owners of potential weak points that might lead to workplace injuries and ill health, and making sure that safety and health is well integrated with recruitment and selection, as well as compensation and benefits, and all of the other HR functions. Some workplaces provide extra pay for risky jobs. For example, the U.S. military gives pay for hazardous duty assignments. Other companies give extra pay to night shift workers, not only because most people don't want to work at night, but also because accidents are more likely to occur then. The two main roles of HR professionals with regard to safety and health is to ensure protection from injuries and freedom from illness. With regard to illness, there are a host of maladies that are known to be caused by carcinogenic agents, often used mainly long ago, that make people deathly ill. One only has to turn on the TV and see a plethora of TV commercials about asbestosis and mesothelioma, or an ad asking if you were employed in a certain workplace like Fort Bragg, North Carolina in the 1980s. We know a lot more now about the impact of chemicals and substances and their role in illness today than we did 50 or 60 years ago. In the past, we often forced workers to work around asbestos and other chemicals, which led to asbestosis. Black lung is another serious illness that occurred to coal miners starting a long time ago. Once these illnesses started popping up and physicians and medical scientists were able to properly diagnose them, it became imperative for companies to make changes to the workplace. They did this because they typically care about their employees' well-being, but also to avoid massive liabilities that can cost them a ton of money. HR managers must be aware of certain requirements for reporting an injury in the workplace. If the injury requires outside medical attention, and 
requires time away from work, it must be reported to OSHA and is called an OSHA recordable. For example, a smash finger that is broken is most probably an OSHA recordable, but a cut finger requiring a Band-Aid is not. Failure to report OSHA recordables comes with serious consequences. Deaths in the workplace will get a visit from OSHA with an investigation, and OSHA can even make surprise visits to companies, which companies typically hate. More on that in a lecture on safety and health. The integration of the safety and health function with the other HR functions should be clear. Compensation is affected by the dangerousness of jobs. Recruiting is more difficult as not many people want dangerous jobs. Training and development is more important in that jobs with lots of risk need constant training and updates to training. These things are all the domain of the HR manager. Let's move on. In states with so-called right-to-work laws, employees cannot be forced to join a labor union as a requirement of their employment. However, not all states are right-to-work states. Some have varying degrees of union requirements. For example, in a closed shop state, being a member of a union is a requirement for some jobs. In a union shop state, Employees don't have to be a member of a union before they are hired, but they must join the union within 30 days of employment. In an open shop, companies hire both union and non-employee non-union members, and union membership is not required for employment. In an agency shop, employees don't have to join the union, but they do have to pay union dues. As you can see, it is rather complicated, and dealing with unions is one of the most important and sometimes most difficult part of an HR manager's job. However, it should be noted that union membership in the U.S. is currently around 10% of all workers, which is way down from, say, 1983 when it was well over 20%. Additionally, the rates of union, unionization vary around the country. For example, Texas has one of the lowest rates at less than 5%, and New York State has the highest rate at over 20%. Men are slightly more likely to be union members than women, and blacks are more likely than other races and ethnicities. Union members in general tend to make slightly more money than non-union members, and unionized managers make slightly more money than non-union managers. The Bureau of Labor Statistics keeps track of these stats, and this link provides you to a recent report on the state of unions in the U.S. This is the official website of the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics. Across the top, you can see that there are a variety of different subjects that are offered, a variety of different data tools, some publications, economic releases, and even some things to involve students with. Let's scroll down a little bit and take a look at the Occupational Outlook Handbook. This handbook has a ton of career information. We can see that the occupational groups are as broad as architecture and engineering, healthcare, production, transportation and material moving. Let's take a look at the management category. These are all of the different management style occupations that one can have. Administrative services, computer information systems managers, financial managers, preschool and child care center directors, training and development managers. Let's click on human resource managers, get some more information on them. Here we can see that in 2022, the median pay was $130,000 a year. 
The typical entry level education was a bachelor's degree. There are currently over 190,000 jobs in HR managers. And the job outlook is expected to grow faster than the average. In the next 10 years, it's expected that 10,000 HR managers will be added. Let's take a look at pay. Here we can see that HR managers' salaries differ by industry. The highest earning HR managers are in the professional, scientific, and technical services industries, and they make almost $154,000 a year on median. The median salary for healthcare and social assistance HR managers is much less than that, but it's still pretty darn good. Now let's take a look at compensation and benefit managers. You can see that they make a little bit more than do general HR managers. Their median salary of compensation and benefit managers is a little bit over $131,000 a year. The same typical entry level education is required. The job outlook is faster than average, but still not as fast as general HR managers. And it appears that 400 people will be taking these jobs in the next, 400 more people will be taking these jobs in the next 10 years. Let's take a look at the highest paying occupations. Well, it appears that those with MD or DDS degrees make the most money. Oral and maxillofacial surgeons have a median pay of about 239000 Psychiatrist, about 227000 Nurse anesthetist, those who do not have a doctoral degree, they still make over $200,000 a year. Let's pick an industry. Let's go with business and financial occupations. So an accountant with a bachelor's degree typically makes about $78,000. Financial analysts make a little bit more at 96000 Human resource specialists make a little less at 64000 Management analysts make 95000 Training and development specialists make 63000 at the median level. This is the PDF that was linked to in the lecture presentation. This is reported unionization member rates. We can see that the union membership rate of public sector workers was more than five times that of private sector workers. The highest unionization rates were among workers in the protective service occupations and in education, training, and libraries. This is a breakdown of men versus women in unions and the racial or ethnicity groups. The earnings report, union membership by state. Some key terms. Here's the giant table. Union membership rates by state in 2022. Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana comprise the West, South, Central. Texas has 4.9% or less. New York State has over 20%. So does Hawaii.
Let's move on. Here we see the different roles that HR employees can have. This is a very simplified organizational chart. There is a direct line from the CEO to the Vice President of Operations and the Vice President of Marketing. There are likely other VPs as well, and all of them are engaged in the line duties that result in the creation of goods and services that the company sells. They are called line managers. Beneath each of these two VPs is a particular manager, and beneath them, there are other strict hierarchical reporting relationships that are not pictured here. You can also see that the VP of HRM's reporting relationship is as a staff or advisory employee. That VP is known as a staff manager. The employees under this VP do not engage in the production of goods or services that the company sells or makes. Executives are top level managers who report to and include the CEO. In this chart, the three VPs are executives only one of which is an HR executive, and all are pictured in red outlined boxes. Of course, the CEO and the other two VPs are also executives, and therefore they too are inside the, the red outline box as the HR executive is. Amongst all HR professionals, there are both generalist and specialist. A generalist performs tasks in a wide variety of HR areas. These jobs are most common in relatively small firms or the top position for an executive in a relatively large firm with many specialists who report to the HR executive. In this particular case, in this diagram, the only generalist is in the green box. Thus, the VP of HRM is both an executive and a generalist and the red outline box is filled in with green. Specialists, on the other hand, tend to be employed by larger firms and they specialize in particular HR functions. So we have specialists who are managers of compensation and benefits, training and development, etc. Clearly, a very small firm with only 100 employees won't have a need for such specialists. And those firms tend to have only one HR person, a generalist, who does it all. In this chart, the two managers and the analyst below the VP of HRM are all specialists, and they are pictured inside blue-filled boxes. That is, they specialize in only one of the several HR functions that we have discussed. They are not executives, but two of them are managers. Let's move on. Here are the day-to-day -day duties and responsibilities of an HR manager. They provide advice and counsel by working as an in-house consultant to executives on issues like corporate policies, labor agreements, ethics, and various needs of the employees. They also give advice to the boards of directors compensation committees, which are common in very large companies and almost all publicly traded companies. They provide service to the company by recruiting, selecting, testing, and training employees. This requires technical competence. More and more HR professionals are finding that people analytics or workforce analytics is a necessary part of their job and that statistics and psychometrics are vital to their success. Additionally, they have to be able to communicate with managers and executives on business topics. So knowing the language of finance and accounting and marketing, etc. is very important as well. HR managers are involved in policy formulation and implementation where they develop policies to alleviate current problems or offset potential new ones and ensure conformity with company policies by line managers. Remember, line managers are in the direct line of making or delivering the products or services of the company. HR managers also have to engage in employee advocacy too. This requires that they listen to employee needs and then professionally represent employees' concerns and issues to managers. Let's move on. That's all. 
Thanks for now.